So before deep diving on the topic of solid state, few words about, about Porsche Consulting. I keep this very short, I promise this to you. Um, so Porsche Consulting is an independent management consultancy. Um, but it, what is very important is uh, we are a, on the one hand a, a part of the VW group, so we are 100% owned by, by Porsche. Um, but nevertheless, um, with regard to projects, we are doing 50% of our projects internally within our group, within all the brands, with, within our own cell producers we have, and also with all the companies we are directly invested in, and the other 50% externally. So, and within this, along the entire value chain, ranging from the OEMs and, and, and going uh, upstream to the, to the raw materials. Um, I think this is, this is somehow important to know because this is from our perspective an unfair advantage having as a management consultancy this leverage of thousands of battery experts within our group and providing this expertise in the end to the entire battery uh, ecosystem. Um, within our discussion or our masterclass today, we will address three main key questions. So, and I think this, this, this are the, the, the key question what the entire so global solid state community is currently focused on. So the first one is all about the technology itself. And answering there the question, what is the technology potential of the solid state batteries? So the second one where we will, where we will jointly deep dive to is the topic of what are the key industrialization challenges to reach in the end a real cost and performance competitive uh, large scale production. And the second one is the topic of when will solid state battery be available on large scale. So before handing over to the panelists, a little bit uh, sitting the scene, uh, setting the scene here. Um, I think when it comes to the technology and the solid state technology, the first thing that remains to be said is there is not one solid state technology. There are in the end really various types of it. Um, main differentiation criteria within this different technology is for sure the electrolyte system. And you see this here in the, in the, in the, in the second line. And you see within the electrolyte system a stepwise solidification um, towards, uh, the, the, let's call it the end game, the all solid state uh, uh, cell, what, what you reach to a certain level. Um, this, this stepwise solidification increases uh, in the end the safety of the, of, of the battery cell. What on the other hand uh, make it, make, makes it possible or enables it to use uh, less stable active materials. And you see this here, this is in the end then the innovation route when it comes to energy density on the anode side. Um, starting with graphite and coming to, to silicon and lithium metal and ending up on the, on the anode free side and reaching then their really energy density of above 400 uh, uh, kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hours per kg. On the other side, you see this with this increasing uh, trend towards solidification. You see challenging occurring when it comes to processability. Um, the more you solidify your, your cell, the more the process differs in the end from your current state-of-the-art liquid uh, uh, process equipment you are currently using. And the, the third challenge here is about raw materials. For sure, we have currently the situation also assuming the liquid route that we have the challenge of potentially short, potential shortages within the, within the lithium supply especially with regard to 2030 to 2032. And what, what needs to be said is when it comes to solid state, this technology will in the end consume significantly more, more lithium in the, in the technology, what makes in the end vertical integration and raw material safeguarding more important. We see here that the panelists uh, are ranging in the end technology-wise from the uh, liquid polymer solid state technology up to the uh, all solid state ceramic based or solid state uh, solid state uh, technology what uh, what makes me really curious about our uh, uh, our our discussion we will have uh, after you gave us each some short presentations about your company and the technology you use so thank you very much and
I hand over to the Shah. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. After maybe I will I will come on the figures there that I see there. <laughs> if you allow me. So uh, let me move ahead to the presentation first. My name is Richard Bouret, but everybody is calling me Richard. Everywhere, I'm the CEO and chairman of uh, Blue Solutions. <coughs> uh, I'm a 28 uh, year old guy in the automotive. This is my passion. I'm there for that, to participate to the transformation of the world that I love. And I think that the world that will influence all the other world we are talking about aerospace, we think about the train, about stationary. Nothing will be possible without automotive. Because automotive is a QCD, is quality, is cost, is development. And this is the only way to have high quality on the short time. So, Blue Solutions, I will come back to that instead of me. It's clear it's a, it's a factory, that it's a business that is special. We start 12 years ago to manufacture in the same time on two continents, uh, solid state battery, solid state battery, lithium metal polymers. And we produced it and we fit it into uh, buses, into, uh, I would say, small trucks on the yard since 12 years and it's running. We even try that on, on small cars. So we have a feedback, holistic view. You know what you can see behind? It's a complete, I would say, knowledge on the value chain. We're able to produce lithium metal foil around 20 micron thickness today. Uh, and you will see in the way that we are using it, it's a bit special because we don't use copper to sustain it. It's a freestanding te technology. We are also producing LFP cathode with absolutely dry process since 12 years. And we are using today LFP technology. But when I will speak about new technology, you will see that you will hear about Gen 4. But we are not new there because we start in 1980s. Such a long time to come here. Such a big amount of capex, opex spent to reach there. But we are there today and such holistic experience building cars, buses, trucks with partners. We have learned. And we will still learn a lot. I can tell you it's not finished. It's not over. You know, we will have a lot of to learn. The Gen 4 that we are producing that will be ready for production at the end of 2027 is there today. We have already result. We are bypassing the 1000 cycle at 40 degrees with 80% efficiency. We are there today. We reach that. But it's not the final target. We would like to make it work at 20 degrees. 20 degrees, 40 to 20, just 20 Cs. It's a lot of work to do, but we are very confident. We are working on pouch and prismatic technologies and we will be able to come with a high uh, density. What I have seen in the in Fabian uh, presentation, I agree with, but this is for the Gen 3. What we are producing, what we are delivering today in 2027 will come with 450 watt hour per kilo and we are already there today. Okay? So, um, of course, we have a, a great advantage in product, in process, process for scale-up, because today we have two mega factories that are running since 12 years in two continents, two teams that are very, I would say, different, but allow us to reach a standard, complete standard. We have um, also developed a new polymers for the Gen 4 that is completely, uh, I would say, agnostic to the type of cathode. We are able to make it work with LFP, LMFP, NMC, and, and that this is a major breakthrough because when you think a gigafactory, my goodness, you want to have just one part number. You don't want to have 20. It's very difficult to manage. So we are there and you can see all the advantage that we are with the micro tin, I uh, would say lithium that we're able to do. Plus minus one micron specification respected in this production. It's very tough. Of course, we are not working alone. We have a lot of partners to reach. What I can disclose today is we are working with Foxconn. Foxconn to work on the two wheelers in Asia first, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, India, and after, of course, we dream to go to China. This is the place we have to go. This is the place where everything is happening. And we have also a BMW a partnership, GDA today, for premium cars and others that will come. And also, since our DNA in the, is in the trucks, uh, we are working with 4C Power for the integration. We have also a new concept of, and I will come back on that, 
if Fabien allows me, uh, on this uh, concept of a very modular gigafactory. We don't believe in the giant gigafactory. It's a mistake, it's not coherent. It's not coherent with sustainability, it's not coherent with service, it's not coherent with the human life. Do you want to work in the factory where you have 5,000 people there? No. In the past it was possible, at the Zola time it was possible, not nowadays. We need to be close to the, to the customer, we need to have closed loop, we need to have a human-sized factory. So we have uh, developed a new concept of gigafactory, 2.5 gigawatt module maximum will be the concept. Also, we are working on recycling. Today, we have a proof of concept. We are going to the second stage within a few months. We are able to take back 90% of the lithium from the cells. And that, this is very important. Again, coherence, coherence, coherence with sustainability. So I have no time to speak about the beginning of the supply chain. Otherwise, Fabian will be angry with me. But um, it's something that also is very important for the supply chain because this will happen the solid state will happen if we are able to really master the beginning of the mining factory coherence with clean extraction, clean refining of the material. That should be a part of our way to be. So, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so very impressive the experience you have in, in, in the solid state manufacturing and development and also very promising number with regard to your, your generation four. Thank you. Um, so the next one on stage uh, is Francisco. Francisco, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Fantastic, perfect. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you guys uh, today in Berlin. Um, we wanted to share with you uh, a little bit of uh, our vision of the industry. What do we do? How do we see the impact of solid state batteries in, uh, in the future of electrification? And what is the role we have uh, in, uh, in Europe as, as, as a company? So first of all, myself, so I'm Francisco. I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Basketball. Uh, a car guy, been working in the car industry for more than 20 years and um, uh, working in electrification since 2008. So almost, uh, uh, almost uh, 15 years now working with uh, batteries and electric cars and trying to figure out how all of this needs to work. How do we get to 2030? How do we get to 2035 with an industry that is 100% electric and uh, an industry in which we are capable to deliver to the end customer the product the end customer is expecting to see at a price that is the, the one that the customer is, is willing to pay with all the supply chain, with all the different steps in the supply chain being economically sustainable, which is clearly not the case today because as you know, batteries, or conventional batteries are too expensive uh, to, uh, to face uh, the mass market in, in good conditions. So we always start showing this type of picture uh, where you see what you already know, right? So this is the price of an, uh, a petrol car and this is the price of the equivalent uh, electric uh, car. And it's, it's pretty striking, right? Particularly when we are, we're looking at a small uh, segment A and B and uh, here also the case of the, the LCV range. Uh, the price, the retail price gap somehow translate the difference in the cost of the product is, uh, is too high. It's too high. Uh, so you see an entire industry being full electric by 2030, 31, 32, 33, 30, 35. If we do nothing or if we have no alternative technology on the table, clearly there is something that is going to happen with the, with the industry, right? So the customers will not be able to pay 15,000 more for a B-segment car uh, in, in, in Europe. So that's the role we see for solid-state batteries. Uh, yes, clearly increase significantly the energy density, increase significantly the safety, but the main purpose it is to unlock the full electrification of the sector by pushing down significantly the cost of the battery pack. In our case, uh, we see a potential to reach a 30% cost reduction versus the conventional lithium-ion batteries that we have today in, in the market. 
by increasing by 50% the energy density uh, and also by leveraging the huge advantages we have in solid state as have a uh, production uh, process that is uh, a way more simple than what we have with conventional, uh, conventional batteries. Here, briefly, let me tell you about what is the, the type of technology we are developing in, in basketball. So our core expertise is in the polymer. So uh, we develop uh, an in-house uh, polymer uh, electrolyte uh, that reuse as much as possible the existing manufacturing equipment we have in the standard gigafactories. Uh, so is um, uh, is a polymer that goes to a, a cross-linking phase uh, after the, the cell assembly to become fully solid uh, during during that process. Uh, we are using lithium metal lithium metal anode, and uh, when using a high nickel cathode, uh, we are getting above 1,000 watt hours per liter in uh, volumetric, and we're getting above 450 watt hours per kilo in, in gravimetric energy density. Uh, but again, the purpose is not to have uh, an extremely high energy density, that's uh, a mean to an end. What we are trying to do here is to significantly reduce the cost by being much more efficient in the way we are capable of storing uh, energy in a, in a battery pack. Overall, making batteries smaller, lighter, and cheaper than what we have today with conventional, uh, conventional lithium-ion batteries. So we have a clear roadmap uh, in, uh, in, in our company. All of these steps are always going in just one direction, which is we need to keep continuing reducing the cost. Uh, so by the moment we get uh, to 2035 with only electric cars in the European market, uh, we have a battery that is cheap enough uh, to make sure that we really get to uh, the, the cost parity with the equivalent petrol, uh, petrol car. And uh, we get to an industry that is economically self-sustainable, in a sense that we will not be depending anymore on public subsidies, because we know what is happening, right? And we see that every week, uh, a country that is no longer providing subsidies has a huge impact in the sales uh, of cars at the end of the day. So we need to be, all of us, reassured that we're getting into an industry uh, that is, is fully under our control and no longer depending on, on subsidies uh, to be profitable. So here you see our technology. We are now working with a high nickel, but we are also working with LFP, uh, LFP cathode, which is at the origin of the technology we are, we are developing, more and more reducing the amount of lithium metal in the, in the anode, and at the end of the day, uh, heading towards a, a composite, composite solution uh, that while from the bill of material is much more interesting, from the process point of view, comes with a number of changes into existing gigafactories, uh, which is not helping in the direction of being, being less expensive than, than traditional, uh, traditional batteries. So in, in our case, uh, so we are a company that is pretty young, so we have a, a, about a year and a half uh, of existence, but we are leveraging uh, more than a decade of research in, in polymers. Uh, by, uh, by Professor Michel Armand and his, his, his scientific team. Uh, so uh, we are moved this year to our new R&D center, which is the one you see in the picture. It's a beautiful building. Uh, obviously, you guys are more than welcome to come and visit uh, our facilities when, uh, when, you, when you pass by, by Spain. More than 100 people already in the, in the, in the adventure. Uh, pretty much uh, the majority of our employees are focused on uh, fundamental research. Uh, developing and optimizing the type of polymers we use. Uh, so we get to the specifications, we maintain the energy density we have now uh, wh while uh, getting more and more optimized in terms of the cost of the, the, final, the final product. Uh, our next step is a one gigawatt hour uh, pilot line that we're gonna be launching uh, mid of next year. And um, very excited about demonstrating how a technology from a early stage development, a technology that is 100% European uh, development, can go into a large industrial uh, scale uh, with the first steps into, uh, into the gigawatt hour, uh, gigawatt hour area. And, uh, and with that, well, thank you very much for, for your attention. I'm more than happy to answer the questions in the, in the Q&A. Thank you. <clears throat>
Yeah, thank you very much, Francisco. Uh, I heard a very promising approach, uh, starting with lower costs and then ending up in uh, finally with really a disruptive technology or uh, technology promise with having lower cost and higher energy, energy density at the same time. Um, now, having heard two persons or two companies uh, where, which were focusing from technological perspective on the, on the polymer approach, now coming to, to ILICA, which really trying to push the boundaries uh, with regard to the, to the ceramic, ceramic systems. And therefore, I'm more too happy to hand over to Robin. <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. It's uh, a great pleasure to be with these uh, illustrious uh, uh, other colleagues. Um, so um, I'll give you an introduction into where we are in, in, in the solid state journey. We're a little bit before these guys, um, but we are making quite significant progress. Uh, from my own perspective, I've been with Elica for just over two years, uh, but associated with the company for, for quite some time. Um, but one thing that, that kind of resonates with me, I used to work for a Trump subsidiary, Trump in Dittingen, making uh, fiber lasers. And we took it from the journey from raw technology where we were uh, drawing fibers and, and blowing up fiber lasers constantly uh, to, to actually getting those uh, to, to an industrialized state and actually also working with Foxconn and selling thousands of lasers that went into uh, manufacturing Apple products. So I kind of get the journey, uh, but clearly it's a challenge. It's always difficult to, uh, to get to where you need to be. So a little bit about Ilica. Uh, Ilica is a, a group of around 70 individuals, uh, ranging from chemists through to um, sort of lab scientists all the way through to engineers. And I count myself as an engineer, although I have a physics degree. Uh, what I've done is bring in uh, an engineering team so that we can move from really the, the research through the development phase and then through into pilot scale manufacturing. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more of that shortly. Uh, Ilica came out of Southampton University as a, as a startup and has been going for around about 18 years. But actually in 2018, we did a, a bit of a pivot uh, into solid state batteries and got some significant funding to, to move us forward. I would say that really in the last year, we've, we've accelerated our development. It was slow, steady. We've actually made some very significant progress in, in the last uh, months uh, and quarters of, of this year, in fact. Um, so you see a little video there. Now, we do actually need to redo this one. This was about a year ago where we, we took our, really a cell at that stage, rolled it up. I think this one has cutting as well, so you, you'll see a solid state battery being cut. But the intention is to prove that solid state batteries have, have the real benefits of, of being truly solid state and not having uh, the fear of creating a fire and so on and so forth. And this is one of our key value propositions, uh, improving the safety, um, matching the performance of or exceeding the performance of um, uh, the, the lithium batteries, uh, but also operating at a wide extreme of temperatures um, that, that's all part of our va value proposition. So um, the way we've done this is to, to work with funding from not only if, uh, uh, we, we are, we are a, uh, listed on the alternative investment market, uh, so, so we have our shareholders, but also we have uh, UK and European funding. Uh, the history program is, is one of our big programs at the moment, a very significant program for us where we're working with a number of suppliers around the UK and Europe. Uh, one of those, Nexian, for example, uh, working on silicon technologies. Our anode is silicon, needs to be silicon. Um, and getting the right match silicon uh, of the anode to the cathode, but also ensuring that, that we have uh, something that we can control the expansion, because clearly that, that's a key element. Um, and working with, with a, whole, a whole bunch of other manufacturers on, on this journey as well. Um, the UK universities are particularly useful because they have incredible facilities, they've had amazing investment, and we can rock, rock along there and we can uh, do some X-ray chromatography and all, all sorts of different, different tests to, to understand how the batteries are operating. So, so really a, a very uh, good and, and appropriate way of using uh, funding from uh, the Automotive Transformation Fund principally in, in the UK. So that program's ongoing and is aligned to our development programs. Now, 
what, what we also realized we had to do from the outset was figure out how we scale up. Now, clearly, we couldn't just uh, rely on technology. We know we have to produce, produce these products. Now, uh, it's quite interesting. I think earlier in the day, there were some discussions around um, the changes that would be needed to achieve um, solid-state batteries in, in manufacture. So we commissioned a study with Comau going back a couple of years, and uh, they actually found that 70% of the equipment can actually be re reused. Some proportion of that has to have some modifications, but it isn't a complete uh, rebuild of gigafactories, which would be an incredibly expensive journey. Um, so, so we're pleased that we, we can show that and we can demonstrate it. It was a very, obviously there's no detail here, it was a very comprehensive study working very closely with them uh, and, and doing the, the, this, this very uh, clear assessment of, of, of where we stand. And of course, on one of those earlier slides, we had double negatives against the manufacturing. I guess I'd kind of dispute that. Maybe just one negative and maybe heading towards positive. So... Um, Really the last slide, and, and I'm sure we'll have some interesting questions, but we, we have a scale-up plan. We're, we are not actually intending to create our own gigafactory. We're going to get to uh, megawatts of capacity, low megawatts, to prove out the technology, to show that we can actually um, demonstrate uh, a capability, that, that it is be believable. Uh, we're working with many OEMs at the moment who are actually taking far more attention at the moment because we've recently passed what we call our D4 uh, milestone, and that is showing um, a reasonable scale battery. We've moved from cells to batteries. We can now call them batteries. And the OEMs are now starting to take attention. We're now briefing them, and we're anticipating delivering in quarter two of next year uh, prototype products that they can evaluate. And of course, they're going to give it a tough time. They're going to uh, try it out in, in great detail to see if they can destroy it um, and, and whether it uh, performs as expected and meets those, those key criteria. So we'll move through that pilot phase. We'll get to with the equipment we're building. I didn't talk about it, but on the previous slide, we're working with a company called MPAC uh, in the UK who are doing the stacking equipment. We're also working with e &R, who are doing the, the coating equipment. But actually what we're doing is putting that equipment in there to show the capability not to get to, to the big scale. So this shows the journey, and the journey ends, uh, or the first part of the journey ends with our first licensing of, of the technologies we're, we're now uh, putting through the development phase. And then we'll go on to license future technologies as we uh, develop the next generation products. We know this is a tough journey. Uh, we can learn together as, as, as part of this um, uh, sort of forum of solid state battery manufacturers. Um, but 10 years back, we're going to, 10 years forward, we're going to look back and we're going to see how these steps forward actually created the solid state batteries that, that we're actually looking for. So uh, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Robin, and very interesting, uh, interesting that you found a way to use 70% of the lithium-ion equipment to be used in the, in the, in the solid-state uh, ceramic-based factory in the end. So now it's the time for the Q&A. So it's also time <coughs> for you that you can, uh, and I think you are now already very experienced, to use the app you have to raise your questions uh, to, 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 to the panel here. Um, Maybe to start with, with one question with regard to the technologies. What we saw now also within the European solid state community that there are really different technological approaches with regard to solid state. And when you look on this globally, I think it's, it's somehow similar. You have the, the global leaders from China who are really focusing on the semi-solid topic. And then you have the, the, the Koreans and the Japanese companies who are really pushing for the, for the ceramic approach. So what do you guys think? Will there be, in the end, one winning technology? Or will, this be in the, will there be a various technology in parallel in the market? Could we answer? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Definitely, I believe that uh, there will be a, a, a big diversity of technology. You know, if you... All the time I try to compare that with the, uh, the area where we are. If you take engine combustions, 
after 130 years, there is still a lot of different technologies in use. And we have 130 years. Now we are just at the beginning of the electrification. Batteries are coming. And the real boom will come in after 2026, 27, not before. It has started, but uh, we are just at the beginning. So technology will be uh, different because different application, different usage, different needs. And that, that we are, me, I'm convinced. This is my convictions. Anyway, it's a life. And more we will go in the future, more diversity in everything will exist. In everything. So we are going to a world where we will have to adapt our knowledge, our applications, and maybe we will have to uh, be able to offer just a small part, but we will have to do it well. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, I, I completely agree. We, we, we need some diversity in the, in the technologies. We need some diversity in the supply chain. Uh, no, no manufacturer, no OEM is going to go with, with one supplier who has this unique, amazing solution because it could, something could go wrong. Technology is, is sometimes unpredictable until okay. you're, until you're in, into the volumes and, and have really settled it. And I, these guys know yeah. a lot about this. So I think that's, that's true. So diversity is good. And, and uh, in, in all my previous experiences, having a competitor is, is, is a fantastic thing. Always good. Just maybe a, a quick comment on that. You know, we have been seen in your charts about you know, liquid semi-solid, oxide, sulfide, polymer. The reality is that nobody cares, right? So uh, this is just for geeky engineers like, uh, like the guys here. At the end of the day, what matters is the performance and the price. And uh, we are moving away from a commodity space mm. where everybody's making the same battery to, uh, to a, a world in which there are gonna be a number of solutions. Uh, each of them might be more suitable for a particular segment than the others. So going from this uh, commodity with everybody's making the same product to a, a portfolio of solutions, uh, each of them are going to be addressing a particular uh, customer need yeah. and uh, getting into specific, into specific markets. OK, thank you very much. And I think we can directly uh, link the, 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 the first question out of the audience to this topic of performance. So the question here is, are SSB really safer than lithium-ion batteries? I think from a, from a concept this, or, fr from, or from, from the common sense, um, the solid-state topic can be one enabler towards higher active materials by remaining then a current level of safety. But maybe from the ceramic and also from the polymer side, do you agree that with the solid-state approach, battery gets, gets, gets safer? And what are maybe the, the levers you need to, to take to, to get this uh, higher level of safety? I see blue solutions in the first question, yeah, so, so you may are, I again? Yeah. Um, yeah, as I said, we start 12 years ago to supply batteries, and uh, we went through different experiences. We had, uh, two year, around two years ago, uh, a fire in two buses in Paris. Uh, it was the, uh, the battery from the same batches, and uh, it was not the problem of the, uh, of the chemistry. It was a problem of process at the time that we were doing. So one stage, over a thousand stage, of the process was not capable. It means 50 ppm risk, and this day, if we have played lottery, we would have won. So uh, we have learned from that. And to go to the uh, safer, you know, thermal runaway for, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Lithium-ion battery, you know, after 80 degrees, better you run away, you know, you take care. But for uh, our battery, I will talk about ours, we are stable until 180 degrees. Why 180 degrees? Because this is the melting point of the lithium metal. Then after you have 240 degrees, the melting point of the polymer. And when these two uh, materials are connecting to each other, then you have a thermal runaway, then you have fires. And I would say that the occurrence to have a fire with lithium metal uh, or solid state battery is very low. It's very low. First of all, there is no battery that uh, shows zero risk. If you take the plane, there is zero risk, but it's limited, but there is a risk. Okay, it's the same for battery, but the risk is extremely limited, but when it occurs, the energy that will 
goes is higher because smaller plays, higher energy. Sorry, but physical law are running and are working everywhere on the earth. So then uh, you will have fire, right? So uh, to conclude, yes, it's safer, but you need to have a safe process for that. It's clear. So probably to complete what Richard was saying, the, 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 the fact is that you can have a, a lot of energy pack into small space. Mm. Right? So when you get to a short circuit, this, this needs to go somewhere. But the, the reality is that the fact that you don't have a flammable electrolyte and you are capable of absorbing much higher temperature before yeah. getting into the short circuit gives the system um, much more latitude to manage the safety risk mm. than if you're just with, yeah. a, with a liquid NMC. NMC battery. So it's safer in the way or in the sense that it's easier to manage from the system point of view. Yeah. <clears throat> I would agree in, entirely. And, and, and what we're doing, although we've chosen the structure of our battery to be inherently safer, and I'm not going to say safe for the same, same reasons, um, what, what we're doing is, is we're proving this at every, every stage of the way. So we have a bunch of tests ongoing now with some of the constituent uh, parts, some of the individual cells and we're building up to, to batteries. So what we need to have is independent validation that we have a safer solution and, and by how much. So it, it's, yeah, they can be safer, but it has to be proven and, and, it, and it's got to be done. It's got to be done just right. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think with regard to, to, to uh, in the end, uh, parameters be, be, besides safety, it's always a discussion about energy density and also cost. So, Francisco, you, you, you mentioned this in, 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 in your presentation mm -hmm. that in the end uh, there will be advantages compared to or in case of cost and also in case of, of energy density, what means in the end this technology is then or have, has a disruptive character. So the question to all of you, maybe you can answer first as you showed this in your presentation. What do you think when or in, in in which time period will you reach the status that you are really advantage in cost and energy density? Well, I think there are a number of factors that are impacting that. Obviously, the, the, the scale from the moment uh, you are doing only megawatt hours is very hard to be competitive versus tens of gigawatt hours. So I see that uh, in the period 2027, 2030, uh, there are going to be a number of players coming with, uh, with large capacity of manufacturing and showing uh, a competitiveness position that is, uh, is more advantageous than, than conventional, uh, conventional batteries. Okay. And, and one point that what we have observed also, uh, to be competitive, you know, battery. When you think battery sales, why many companies are not going there? Because it's a capex, the ticket to enter there. You know, when you want to produce cells, it's billion. You count in billions of euro. You count on that. This is the unit you are counting, okay? So uh, the point between lithium ion and, and solid state is that what we are estimating is that due to the fact that we have less steps to produce, estimations that are leading us between 20 to 30 percent less capex and uh, far more or less surface to be used. On top of that, I would say the throughput time in the gigafactory is uh, lower. We are estimating two days for solid state and more than 20 days for lithium ion because you have degazing, you know, degazing takes time. So when you are selling for a billion battery, when you have 500 million euro monthly sales in one plant, better you do it in two days than you do it in 22 days, mm -hmm. right? So that this is another effect, cash, exactly. capex, you know, and the cost that you will have to depreciate on your PNL on monthly basis. That it's a fact. After you have scale, you know, when you, com when you compare the solid state today, we are talking about mega factory today. The giant in the lithium ion speak about giga. Of course, they have the scale today. They have the sourcing, they have everything, okay? But later on, when we will come, and it will happen, the solid state, because people, premiums, commercial vehicles at the beginning will need that. They will need it. So we will come. It will be a bit more expensive. But after, they think TCO, total cost of ownership, what it will be. 
we know today that we will be able to be competitive. But after scale up, we need scale, scale effect on the full supply chain. And there is some question that will come on the lithium later or other material. Yeah. It's linked to that. We need to secure the supply chain of it. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. Robin? Um, <coughs> yeah, well, so the, the scale thing, absolutely agree. We, we sometimes at Illica, we, we, we try and be good at everything. But actually, we know we're going to get to a certain level where we can demonstrate the base capability. We can do the theory. We can do the maths around how the price is going to be. But what we're not going to do is do all those detail, continuous improvement, marginal gain steps, which, which all add up to something really significant. We know this with the Tour de France and the riders and how they have to have everything just right and then they can win. So we, we won't delude anybody in terms of, well, okay. In fact, in the lab, we can demonstrate some fantastic um, mm. uh, results, some, some crazy what, what hours per kilogram. But the question I would ask is, well, okay, that's one. Can you do 10? Oh, that's difficult. Can you do 100? We go through a bit of that journey, and then we get into the, the scale up where we really find out what, what the key parameters are, and that's real manufacturing engineering. So inherently, it can do it. It can absolutely do it. Inherently, it has shorter cycles, fewer steps, and so on and so forth. But we need, we need that scale. Yeah, thank you. And, and maybe coming back to the point also you mentioned in this context, you said two, two, two words uh, about the uh, uh, processability mm -hmm. or the manufacturing where you see yep. advantages due to the lower footprint. And the other topic was about funding. I want to come back Ooh. to both because I think these are <laughs> two very important topics. So you said about advantages in the, in the solid state manufacturing as you need uh, lower through output time, you have a lower footprint and so on. But on the other hand, are there also risks? So what comes to my mind, uh, I think you are processing lithium metal foils. And what I learned once is when you bring lithium metal to ambient air, this causes or it has a high probability to cause also fire during production. So do you guys see, besides these advantages in production, also risks that occur when producing solid state batteries? And do you see for these risks levers how to mitigate them in the end? I mean, lithium metal in the air is, uh, you will lose the, the performance, but you will not create fire unless the humidity is very tremendous. Lithium doesn't like water. Uh, if you put the lithium in the water, you will have a firework there. But otherwise, in the air, you know, you will have a problem, then your lithium will not react. So you put a very uh, expensive material for nothing in your... Um, now, I think, yeah, they, 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 of course, there is all the time risk manipulating a, a product with high energy. It will be far more risky with uh, sodium metal. Sodium metal will be a risk, definitely a risk in the air, not the lithium. But um, yes, we have to take care, but it's, it's global. We have to come back to the principle of, of physics. A lot of energy in the small box, small volumes. It is all the time something that potentially is dangerous. Okay? On top of that, when we do big sales, robots are normally in our factory, you don't have too much operators. Robots, because so precise that you cannot touch anything with your hand. Plus, minus one microns. You make a mistake, you're wrong, okay? You lose. Then we need to have robots, robots, high capability. And then when we do that, there is a risk still because once upon, a, you know, after in the line, you will have people that will touch it at the assembly. And then you have to take care, it's dangerous, okay? After you have, when you fit in the car, after when you use the car, if you have a crash, what's happening, you know? That is another story that is hanging. If the car is crashed and jump into water, not good, right? So that you need to think about that and we have to work on that, on the FMEA of the product at the end yeah. and to, to be able to associate every a solution for every risk, like they do for the plane industry. It's very close, you know? Now we are getting closer to aerospace. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> now with regard to funding, and I think, Robin, Robin you, you presented this, so you have a business model where you said you will not go to the, to the large-scale production by, by, sure. by, by, by yourself. So what, what, what we understand is when you, when you really start and you start with a platform development of the chemistry, then going to pilot scale and 
reaching then a competitive uh, factory size on, in the giga scale, what is to our knowledge at currently around about 30 to 50 gigawatt hours uh, per annum. Mm -hmm. So this takes you, or this, this costs you in the end more than 5 billion. So it's about so, capex, but it's also about ramp up costs where we okay. saw previously in the, in the presentation about the scrap rate you will have in the beginning. So the question bes beside Robin, uh, to you, uh, uh, Francisco and, and, and Richard, are you planning really to go this large scale game to, the, uh, to, to compete with the global leaders or are you also thinking to, to other directions when it comes to scale? <laughs> there is many solutions. You know, I think that uh, it's a long time we are alone at Bolloré Group. Okay, we, um, we can obviously go alone. Should we? I'm not sure. I think that it's good to go further. As I say all the time, to go alone you go fast, but with you you go further, you know. So then, um, yeah, we have to do, but it's a question of business model. We, I, I think that like diversity, we need to be very, very open in our business model. We can go for licensing, we can go to produce sales, we can produce packs, according to customers, we will judge that, you know. And every time we will embark with us, we will try to embark with us some partners on the boat that will bring some, uh, I would say, synergy with us. I was speaking about Foxconn, mm. but we can speak about many other partners under us. You cannot do everything alone. It doesn't work. Oh, it's, a, it's a futile. So we will find the difficulties to find the right partner at the right time. And we will work on that as far as, far as we are concerned as Blue Solution. We will try to find the right partner. That's clear every time, you know, because it's not just a question of funding. It's a question to find the people that will participate with you in finance, but will bring something in technology, in network, in sales, in business. Thank you very much, Francisco. Yeah, I think what Richard is, uh, is, is explaining this right, rightfully. I think we need to be smart in the way forward. Yeah. Uh, but by, by the time we are ready to push the accelerator and scale up, uh, industrially speaking, uh, there are going to be a lot of gigafactories already out there. Right? So, uh, uh, obviously, I mean, you, you're going to raise a lot of doubts into the financial community. If you start saying, okay, my job is to put uh, 500 gigawatt hours out there and kill everybody else, <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah. that, that's not the way no. things should be done. No. So, uh, at some point, uh, Europeans, we need to, you know, talk to each other and uh, join forces when it makes sense and collectively get the industry financially working, yeah. right? So, uh, and uh, my, my view is, is yeah, no, probably the same as Richard was I, saying, no. uh, this is a collective game. Yes. If we try to play solo, probably we're gonna die uh, more. Uh, we'll die quicker. solo. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, then let's grab one question from the audience. So this is, can solid state batteries really be recycled, I think? First of all, till you, till you uh, on the one hand, when you have them end of life coming out of the cars, but I think also with regard to the factory scrap you are producing in your, in your factories currently. So um, I like to speak, I'm sorry. But, uh, it, uh, you know, recycling first, you have no choice. You know, it's not a question, is it or not? It has to be. After that being said, yeah, okay, how we do it. You know, in Blue Solution, we have more than 3 million, I would say, sales in the nature today, yep. okay? We will have to take them back. We start 12 years ago, now they start to come. What we do with that? We pile up them somewhere? Or we start to recycle that? Because there is a lot of lithium inside, first inside. You know the price of the lithium. So first, there is one economical interest to do it. And in the same time, this is what we are selling to our, I would say, customers. This is what we are selling to our employee. You come to our company because we are the company of the future. We are sustainable. It's not just the words. So we have to do that. Lithium, we are at 90%. Matter of fact, KPI is today. We want to go further. It's difficult because technically I will not enter into the detail. We can go to 100, but it's risky. And after we talk about what you know, black mass, you know, polymer mixed with lithium, iron, and many things, how we can do. There are many technologies to do that. The difficulty today is to find the one that will be sustainable in energy and that will be efficient. Today, you have a lot of efficient technology, 
but they are taking so much energy that it's not really relevant. So we need to find a compromise, find the right partner to do that. We will not do that. We will do the lithium, but not the black mass. After, there are other components, aluminum, uh, little copper uh, contactors that it's quite easy to do. And it depends on the technology, and maybe mm. I'll let you... Robin, <coughs> I think what, what we believe fundamentally <coughs> is that the solid-state batteries ca can be recycled, but, but there, are, there are going to be some complex processes involved. Some of those haven't yet been, been established. But they should be recyclable more safety, I mean, particularly if it's fully solid-state. Yes. So maybe that takes, again, the processing, it, it, it simplifies, and so on and so forth. So we're, doing, we're actually doing a study as part of our history program with HSS, HSSMI to, to, to really understand the recycle, the reuse, um, the repair. So yeah. we, we heard about this earlier. And if we can push those forward, I think, again, working collectively to, to come up with these solutions, we have to do it. So the, the change is, you know, if, uh, how easily it can be recycled. No, it doesn't depend if it's solid or liquid. Right? So you can have different technologies in solid that have a totally different approach. Right? So when you're looking at a sulfide uh, electrolyte, recycling, probably you shouldn't be so close to the place where this yeah. is being recycled. Yeah. Uh, so it depends. But at the end of the day, they, they will need to go through the process of uh, recycling of normal batteries yeah. sooner or later. Yes. And actually, one key thing about the electric battery, the technology we've chosen is, is an oxide is, uh, rather than a sulfide. So it, hopefully... It I know, that's why I would say, exactly. otherwise Thank I wouldn't. I wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Is it a common enemy? <laughs> yeah, quite. quite. Good. Um, so let, let, let's come a little bit more to the, to the uh, economic side and to the market side. What do you think... Uh, from technology perspective, what market share can solid state can the solid state uh, technology address by 2035? 2035. <laughs> when so many and maybe yeah. to make it make it a little bit more easy and to build a bridge. And what do you think are the first applications that are really using the solid state technology, let's say in a giga scale? We, we've spent a lot of time talking to hypercar manufacturers, in fact, uh, because we, we know in those very early days, solid state won't be the cheapest. Um, so there is a possibility if we can get the, the balance right here. And, and there's an interesting one that we haven't kind of touched on. Um, there's, there's the balance between energy and power. So ensuring that we're, there's a question about fast charging. Yes, fast charging is possible. Uh, when I talk to our marketing team, of course they want fast charging, they want the maximum energy density, the volumetric and gravimetric, and so on and so on, at all temperatures. But there are compromises to be made. So I think what we've started to think about in the fir those first implementations may be in a lower scale market, but a kind of higher value market, and there are some OEMs we're talking to in that regard, um, and, and do those trade-offs. Because yes, people do want to have a fast charge, but actually, do they need 10 minutes from 0 to 100? No. They probably need, I have a Jaguar I-Pace, so I know I need, when I get to 50%, I could do with putting another 20, 30% in there to get up to something that gives me good range. So I think there are some practical pro propositions that we can find that solution for solid-state batteries and, and kind of get there quicker and not be constrained by the price in the very first instance, because that would take time. Okay. Um, with, with an eye on the clock and seeing that this masterclass will, will end in two and a half minutes, I want to use the chance or the last two minutes uh, to, to hear your, your closing statements, so really condensed in, 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 in two sentences about this, this uh, solid state topic and maybe starting with you, you Francisco. <clears throat> well, I think co collectively we are, we are facing a, a, a major challenge in this electrification, right? So we have been talking about that for, for years and years and years. Now, now we need to make it happen. And we need to make sure that the European industry can cope with this change, can adapt, again, uh, can survive and, and remain as competitive as it has traditionally been uh, for, for, for decades and decades. And uh, to me, I think collective is, is a key word. So we need to do it together. And uh, we, need to, uh, we need to do it 
uh, in cooperation with uh, with the public authorities that, that mm. so far have been reacting, but they need to they need to do it faster, and much more aggressively than they have been doing until now. Thank you, Robin. Um, so I, I think what I find very interesting, and, and the journey at Illica kind of underlines this. That there are many different chemistries. There are many research programs which, which have to continue. But actually, more recently, we've made pragmatic decisions based on engineering approaches so that we can turn those chemistries into something that can become a, a disruptive technology that, that goes the, the full distance. So whilst we'll continue trying the esoteric solutions, getting solid state to market, getting, getting a baseline, again, working collectively to, to get to that. But that, for me, is the journey and all of those incremental improvements and, and converting those gigafactories so that they can get to a point where they can make solid state batteries. And maybe it isn't so hard, but it will take a lot of, a lot of effort and a lot of time. You shouldn't dispute that. Yes, collective, we should be. I think it's, it's clear. So for example, for us, as a matter of fact, what we have decided is to be able to offer to the competitor our lithium uh, metal foil, which is not uh, available at this quantity and quality in the world. We think we can boost the roadmap to our competitor and we think it's good at the end for us because we come with a solution that is a bit uh, new. And if you are the only one in the OEMs, you know, OEMs, they like to have multi-choice, you know, uh, this one, this one, this one. So we are doing that, so we are not working alone. We will create these openings, we'll work together and also we should not forget that battery is not just electrochemistry. This is more than that. This is, we should have holistic view. We will have to develop more software, more clever way. Um, I would say dual chemistry in the future will come. We need energy. We need power. Sometimes we need power, sometimes energy. But you can never, with one just type of chemistry, offer both. Okay? So we will need to, uh, to, uh, to be open on that, to be more creative, and to work more together because if we want to fight against the big giants that are there, David and Goliath, Goliath was there in Europe, but uh, you know, it was, I think that we have to really uh, work together with different uh, players. Yeah, Th thank you very much. And also from my side, you said this work against the giant players was really a pleasure for me to, to have you here on stage, as pleasure. especially in the solid state topic. Everybody is talking about the, the, the Asian players, the global leaders there in Japan, Korea, and China, and also about the tech startups in the in the in the oh, US yeah. who are there. And I'm really happy that I had now, or that we had here this this European expertise uh, uh, on the stage. And I'm really looking forward that that these European activities are really accelerated and being in the end uh, co competitive on a, on a on a global scale. And few. therefore, a big applause for the for the Thank panelists you for here.